Just as Brother Brendan read uh, a few moments ago, we are in John chapter 3. I asked Pastor Brendan to read verse 1 through 15 because that is the, the large chunk of this interaction that Jesus is having with the man named Nicodemus. The man named Nicodemus. He has been teaching Nicodemus about the new birth. Nicodemus believes that he and the other Pharisees understand something about Jesus, where he came from, but Jesus is going to uh, clarify exactly where he came from in the verses we're going to look at this morning. So we're going to look specifically at John chapter 3, verse 11 through 15. What we're looking at this morning is the profit and the price of the new birth. The profit and the price of the new birth. This is what Jesus reveals himself to be here in verse 11 through 15, both the prophet and the price of the new birth. In verse 11 through 15, Jesus explains to Nicodemus that he is indeed the divine authoritative spokesman, the divine authoritative prophet of the new birth. Jesus is the one qualified to tell us heavenly things. And as Jesus tells us heavenly things, he does so with precision and he does so with authority. And you can trust when Jesus tells us heavenly things that they are indeed fact because Jesus has seen these things with his own eyes. But not only is Jesus the divine, authoritative prophet of the new birth, he's also the price of the new birth. He is the price of the new birth. Here, Jesus, in these early chapters of John, already begins telling men, telling mankind, what would happen to him. He would be hung on a tree, that he would be hung on a pole, and he would be the means of the healing that God would provide for the nations. So in verse 11 through 13, you see the prophet of the new birth, and in verse 14 through 15, you see the price of the new birth. I'll put those two things together in a summarizing statement if you wanna write this down with me. That Jesus suffered death as the price of eternal life. Jesus suffered death as the price, not a price, as the price of eternal life. And you'll see that that word, the, is necessary. There is no other price to be paid. There is no other means of salvation. Jesus suffered death as the price of eternal life. A gift received by those who believe. A gift received by those who believe. Everyone will live forever. Not everyone will live forever in the kingdom of God. Very few people go to heaven. Very few people go to heaven. It is not true to say at every funeral attended, they're in a better place. One, we are not the authority to cast that judgment. And two, the Bible tells us that most people, when they die, are not in a better place. That narrow is the way that leads to salvation. And there are few who find it. But broad is the path that leads to destruction, and there are many that go by it. Eternal life is paid for by Jesus, and only by believing in him does a person actually receive eternal life. So let's look real quick. At verse 1 through 10, just by way of reminder, I want to read these verses in your presence. And then we're going to jump into verse 11 through 13. Starting in verse 1, it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. 
This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know. Mark that in your mind. Rabbi, teacher, we know. We know what? We know that you are a teacher from, come from God. We know your origin. We know who has sent you. That's going to be called into question because Nicodemus is right. But Nicodemus does not understand the extent to which he is right. He, he intimates that God has sent Jesus, but he doesn't understand that Jesus actually came from God. You see, the, the prophets of the Old Testament, you could not say that John the Baptist, the bridge prophet between the old and the new, you could not say that John the Baptist was come from God. You could say that John the Baptist was sent by God. You could say that Isaiah was sent by God, that Ezekiel was sent by God, that Nathan was sent by God. But none of these men had come from God. Nicodemus says, we know that you are a teacher come from God. And the question is, Nicodemus, do you really understand what that means? And do you really understand just how true that statement is? Jesus is going to say, you don't know anything. You think you know where I come from. You think you have an idea and you speak politely. But you don't understand the extent to which you're right. And you don't understand who's standing in front of you. We know Verse 2, that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs, these miracles that you do, unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You got a perception problem. You got a composition problem. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus not only has a perception problem and a composition problem, he's got an understanding problem. He doesn't understand how, how a birth can happen outside of human means. Jesus answered, verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he's got to be washed, he's got to be regenerated by the Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. you got an entrance problem. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Nicodemus, you got an impossible problem. You can't change what you're made of. And that's why you can't see. That's why you can't enter the kingdom of God. You've got an impossible problem. But Nicodemus has a problem that God can overcome. A problem that the solution is not initiated or controlled by man. Jesus is going to announce the solution here. He says in verse 8, The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus says, this is how God overcomes all these problems that you have. God, by his sovereign omnipotence, his sovereign power, causes you to be born again. And you don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know how it's going to happen. But better believe it, you know when it's happened. Just like you don't know where the wind comes from or where it goes. But you can see and feel its effects. Nicodemus still having an understanding problem. Nicodemus said to him, verse 9, how can these things be? How, how can it be? Je what is Jesus telling him? He's saying this is what's going to happen. When a person's born again, they're born of water, they're, they're washed, they're cleansed by God, they're born of the Spirit, their, their composition, their constitution changes, new heart, new mind. This, this is what happens. This is the, the earthly side of it. This is what happens on earth that you perceive when you're born again. And Nicodemus says, I want to know how that works. I want you to tell me the heavenly side of how it works. Tell me how the miracle works out. 
Nicodemus said in verse nine, how, how can these things be? Tell me, explain to me how it works. Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? Are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? You're the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things. And as we saw last week, Nicodemus should have understood these things. It was not for lack of information. It was for lack of understanding. He should have understood it, but he couldn't understand it because he wasn't born again. Repeatedly in the Old Testament, God told his people that he would bear them again. He'd take out that heart of stone, give them a heart of flesh. He would put his spirit within them and he would cause them to walk in all his statutes. Sounds like the new birth, doesn't it? Why can Nicodemus not connect these two dots? Why, why can he not understand this? Well, without being born again, you cannot perceive the kingdom of God. You cannot see it. You can't understand it. Nicodemus is a man like us. Nicodemus is a man in need of new birth. Nicodemus is a man in need of grace. You the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. Nicodemus, you say you know that I'm come from God, but you don't understand anything that I'm talking about. You don't understand how it works in the earthly terms what happens to a person. You want me to explain to you the heavenly means of accomplishing this and you won't understand any of it. You won't understand any of it. But you can trust the words of Jesus. Look at verse 11 through 13. Here he's going to tell Nicodemus how he knows this is what God does. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know. Who is this we? Who is this we? Some commentators believe that Jesus is including his disciples in this because they're going to be the authoritative messengers of the message. So the disciples know. What does he say? He says, we speak of what we know. Well, that certainly could include the disciples. He's teaching them. Lo and behold, he may have even taught them already about the new birth. We speak of what we know. I tend to believe that Jesus is not specifically speaking of the disciples. I believe that Jesus is using what, what I would call the divine we. Jesus is speaking of himself in the plural. Jesus is mentioning here of the Trinity. We, Jesus, the Son of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, bearing witness to the truth of God. So he says, we speak of what we know. We're not coming to this understanding, we just know it. We speak of what we know and bear witness. That's the word martario. It means to bear witness in a legal sense. Standing up in a court and bearing witness in front of a judge on pains of perjury. We speak of what we know and bear witness to what? to what we have seen. What has he seen? The wind blows where it wants to. It comes from where you don't know, it goes to where it, you don't know. Jesus says, we have seen that. You don't see it because you're man. Jesus says, we have seen it. We have seen the wondrous working of God in the new birth. We have seen it with our eyes, and we bear witness about it. We bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. That's your problem, Nicodemus. We're telling you the truth. We're telling you an eyewitness account of the truth. You must be born again, and why is this strange to you? You must be born again. The problem is you just won't believe it. You just won't believe it. You won't receive that testimony. Verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? That's what Nicodemus has just asked for. He says, how can these things be? Jesus has told him the things that happen on earth. When a person is born again, they're cleansed, they're changed by the Spirit, 
You can see the effect of that, just like you can see the wind affecting the trees. You can see these earthly things. Nicodemus says, well, how does it work behind the scenes? How does it work in heavenly terms? And Jesus says, I've told you earthly things, and you don't believe. How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? You want to understand all the minutia and the spiritual things that happen behind the scenes in the divine mind of God, but you won't, you won't believe, you won't just receive the testimony about what's so plainly in front of your face. This is, many people have this problem. Oh, just want to go, want to go deeper and deeper and understand deeper and deeper things. Just blow my mind with this deep, hidden knowledge of God. When God's saying, obey my commands, stop lying. Stop gossiping. Be kind. Love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. And now people want to, want to seek out some da Vinci code. And they the, the want to turn the Bible into this mysterious mystery that needs to be unraveled. When Jesus is saying, if you love me, keep my commands. Love God, love your neighbor. And all of the Bible, all of the law is summarized in this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. There it is, Simple. So easy a child can understand it. Jesus says, oh, look, if I, I explain earthly things to you, you just want to go deeper and deeper and understand all these other things, but you won't receive what's plainly in front of you. Why are we going to go to class 103 when you can't graduate out of 101? Why are we going to do that, Nicodemus? Why can't Nicodemus graduate out of 101, new birth? Why can't he graduate out of that understanding? Not born again. He can't understand it. He can't perceive it. He won't receive the things of the Spirit because he is of the flesh. How can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? It's not that Jesus doesn't know the heavenly things. And it's not that the things that Jesus has told Nicodemus are untrustworthy. Well, we know the things that Jesus has told Nicodemus are trustworthy. Listen to what Jesus says about himself. He's already said we, we bear witness to what we have seen. The problem is you just won't receive it. Well, where did you see these things? Where did you see these heavenly things, Jesus? Well, I thought Nicodemus had already answered his question. Didn't he say, Brother Dale, we know that you're a teacher come from God, so how would he see the heavenly things? Well, he'd see it in heaven. If he came from God, he would have seen heavenly things there in heaven. But that's not what Nicodemus means. Nicodemus is being polite, it seems. But he's very right in his sentence. Look at verse 13. Look at the claim that Jesus makes. No one has ascended, and a bino, gone up. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended, catabino, come down. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus says, this is how I know. This is how I have seen these truths. This is how I can authoritatively tell you, you must be born again. And without being born again, you can't see or enter the kingdom of God. This is how you know it's trustworthy. I have seen it because I was in heaven. And I came down from heaven. And he says, nobody has ascended to heaven. And then come back down to tell you these things. Those who have ascended into heaven, by God's grace, they're still there. Only one has come back down. I don't need little kids' parents to write books about dreams they had when they passed out or flatlined in the hospital to tell me about heaven. They did not ascend into heaven. They did not. They had a dream. There were all lots of anesthesia but they did not ascend into heaven. Heavenly truth is given by God. Jesus says, we know what we're talking about because we're the only ones who have ever been to heaven and come down here to tell you these things. No one, he says, has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. 
Now, when we hear that term, term, the son of man, you know, when we think about that in its most general form, the most plain fashion, we think, well, all of us in here are either sons or daughters of men. So is Jesus saying he was born of man? Well, issue there, right? Jesus is conceived of by the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin. So he's not exactly a son of Adam, is he? Not exactly the same way we were conceived of by Adam. He has a human nature. He's conceived of in the womb of Mary, but he's also divine in origin, conceived of by the Holy Spirit, come from God. So he calls himself the son of man. Now when we read the son of man, we may not necessarily have a lot of light bulbs going off, but I can tell you this, Nicodemus should have had a million light bulbs going off in his head when Jesus claims to be the son of man. Because Nicodemus is what? He is the teacher of Israel. He is the teacher of Israel. The quote, the son of man, is a reference directly to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. This is the vision the prophet Daniel had. Again, it's a vision. Daniel saw something in heaven. He didn't go to heaven. He saw it in heaven, and then he told people. I saw in the night visions, and behold... With the clouds of heaven, there came one like a, like a son of man. That means coming down, descending. Coming one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days. That is God the Father. He came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him, to who? To the son of man. And to him, the son of man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Jesus is claiming to be the son of man who came before God the Father and was given a kingdom a kingdom to whom all peoples, nations, and languages would owe their allegiance. And his kingdom would never perish or pass away. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I lived in Nazareth for a short period of time. I was born in Bethlehem as a child. But there was a time when I stood before God the Father and he gave me the kingdom. So you're hearing this testimony about the kingdom of God, seeing it, entering it, not just from the prophet of the kingdom, you're hearing this testimony from the king of the kingdom. Nicodemus, the problem is not in what I'm telling you, the problem is that you won't believe it. For many people this is true. The problem is that not that people don't understand what's being told to them. The problem is they won't believe it. What does it mean to believe? What, pisteo, what, what does it mean to believe? To believe literally is to put one's confidence in, to put one's trust in, to say, I put all my chips in that basket. I put all my investment in that person. I put all my trust in Jesus. And in order to put all my trust in Jesus this is what it means. It means my life is given to him. The things I think, the things that I do, the places I go, the way I interact with people, that all belongs to Jesus. He is Lord over all of it. He is my Lord, he is my king. I'm gonna go ahead and live in the reality that he is the king of the kingdom and I am his servant. That's what it means to believe in Jesus. And Nicodemus, he wants to call Jesus a teacher, but he's not yet ready to call Jesus king. Not yet ready to call Jesus Lord. But Nicodemus needs to understand the testimony that Jesus is bearing is true. He is the son of man. 
He came before the ancient of days and received the kingdom. You know, 13 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus is referred to mostly by himself. He refers to himself as the Son of Man. This is the second of 13 of those references. In John 1, 51, he told his disciples, namely Nathaniel, he said that they would see the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Here in chapter 3, verse 13 through 14, the Son of Man is the one who comes down to be hung on a pole for the healing of the nations. In chapter 5, verse 27, the Son of Man is given authority by God the Father to execute judgment. In chapter 6, verse 53, the Son of Man gives the food that endures to eternal life. In John 6, 57, the Son of Man is the one who gives his body and blood to be received for eternal life. In John 6, 62, the Son of Man is the one who will ascend into heaven. And in John 8, 28, he is the one who speaks in the authority of the Father. In John 9, 35, the Son of Man is the one in whom we must believe. And in John 12, 23, he is the one who has been glorified in his suffering. In John 13, 31, he is the one ultimately glorified in his ascension to the Father. Jesus is not merely claiming to be a teacher come from God. He is the Son of Man come from God. This testimony that Jesus gives is trustworthy because he is the authoritative divine prophet of the new birth. He's the authoritative divine prophet of the new birth. And this is what Jesus says about the new birth. He's already told us we must be washed by God. He's already told us we must be changed by the Holy Spirit. These are things that we cannot do. But here in verse 13 through 14, Jesus is gonna tell us how God pays for the new birth and how we receive this gift of eternal life. Look at verse 13, or verse 14 through 15 with me, please. Verse 14 through 15, we're going to see Jesus as the price of the new birth. And really, there are two expenses, two expenses that are mentioned here in verse 13 and 14. There is an expense paid to achieve, achieve the new birth. And there is an expense paid to receive the new birth. An expense to achieve and an expense to receive. You see both of these in verse 14 and 15. Here it is. And as Moses, verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Nicodemus would have readily understood what Jesus was talking about, this lifting up of a serpent in the wilderness by Moses. Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. That is a reference to an event that's recorded in Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21, verse four through nine. Let me read this in your presence. As the children of Israel had come out of Egypt and they are wandering in the wilderness, they had not yet come into the promised land. They are learning the lessons of faith, learning the lessons of obedience and struggle there in the wilderness. And they're going to learn the lesson of salvation in this event. You're gonna learn the lesson of salvation. Numbers 21, verse four through nine says, from Mount Hor, they set out by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. Not much in human nature has changed, has it, Shane? And the people became impatient on the way. Verse five, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? We're not gonna talk about how confoundingly ridiculous that statement is. They were slaves in Egypt. Their children were drowned in the Nile in Egypt. They were pressed with hard labor in Egypt. And now they encounter struggle in the wilderness and they say, why is God been so ugly to us.
Has he taken us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. Listen to how ridiculous this is. And we loathe this worthless food. I thought you just said there's no food and water. But what you mean is you just don't like the food God gave you. Poor pitiful me. Oh, God, give me. Oh, God, give me. Give me, give me, give me. And God says, I already did that. You just don't like what I gave you. Only there's no water. You've been drinking water from a rock. You've been eating food delivered on the daily to you. You just don't like God's provision. A lot of lessons there for another time. Verse six, then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. What a fiery serpent. Were these snakes actually on fire? I don't know, could have been. There wasn't a picture included in this. They might have been on fire. Some commentators say this, that it could have been that when the snakes bit the people, that there was major inflammation and there was a burning all over the body. And then some people even perished from the snake bite. Either way, actual snakes on fire that kill people or actual snakes that bite people and it feels like fire and it kills people, I don't want either one, Kim. I don't want to deal with either one. But the Lord, in his wrath, sent fiery serpents among the people. They bit the people so that many people of Israel died. Verse seven, and the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. Isn't that the way it normally works? Complain, complain, complain. God gives us our just desserts, and then we, we say, oh, God, save us. I thought you didn't like what he provided for you for salvation. You didn't like the food or water he gave you the first time. Now you want him to save you again? It's amazing that God doesn't get tired of us. He's not like us. Pray to him that he may take the serpents away from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, hey, how would you think that, that God would provide healing for them? Take the serpents away. Take our problems away. Just give us healing. Let Moses walk through the Israeli wilderness hospital and just heal everybody with a slap of his coat. They'll all be healed and just drive the serpents away. Maybe that's the way God would provide salvation. He just forgive us all. No big deal. But that's not what the Lord tells Moses. Verse eight, and the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, so the snakes are gonna continue. The snakes are gonna continue. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, sees what? Sees that serpent on the pole. When they see it, they shall live. So God's not gonna take their problem away. He's not going to take away what kills them. He's just gonna make them understand that their salvation is dependent on his provision. That's what he's gonna teach them in this. Not taking the problem away. Verse nine, so Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. In 2 Kings chapter 18, verse four, we actually come to understand that this bronze serpent on a pole became an idol in Israel. And we actually learn even what they called it. This is just an interesting fact for you. This is during the reign of Hezekiah. It says, he removed the high places, 2 Kings 18, 4, and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings. Literally, they had burned incense to it. They started worshiping. They started worshiping this thing rather than worshiping God. And it was called Nehushtan, Nehushtan is built off of two Hebrew words. Nehush means brawn and Nahash means snake. You put them together, Nehushtan sounds like bronze snake in the Hebrew. So you understand what God has done. He doesn't take away, he doesn't take away their problem, but he provides them a solution. And he provides them a solution that depends on what? We could say it depends on faith, but really they, they, it depends on sight. Just look up. 
Just look up. If you, just look at the pole. If you look at the pole, you're going to be healed. These are elementary lessons. Just depend on God. Just enough to lift your eyes up and look at the pole and you're going to be healed. They're just learning to trust him. Just a little bit. Lift your eyes up. Now what does Jesus mean when he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up? What does Jesus mean? I'll, I'll tell you that I believe that this is one of the most often misinterpreted verses that I'm about to read because people interpret this verse erroneously and they talk about Jesus being lifted up as happening during praise and worship. We're just gonna lift up the name of Jesus today. We're just gonna lift up the name of Jesus because when Jesus' name is lifted up, he draws all people to him. And there's like this secret formula. We praise Jesus, people get saved. But that's not what Jesus says here in John chapter 12. Listen to John 12, 32 through 34. And I, Jesus says, when I am lifted up from the earth, is that praise and worship? When I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Here's the explanation. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Let me tell you, the people understood it too. So the crowd, verse 34, answered him, we have heard in, from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? They understood what Jesus is saying. To be lifted up on a pole in Jesus' day is to be hung on a tree. It is to be killed and executed the way that Romans executed their enemies. It's the way that Romans would execute criminals. And Jesus says this, that just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, and people beheld that bronze serpent, and they were healed, so also must the Son of Man, the one who came before the Ancient of Days to receive the kingdom, to come to earth to declare the kingdom, that the king of the kingdom is going to hang on a pole and die. The king of the kingdom is going to be the price to purchase our entrance into the kingdom. He is going to be the penalty paid for us to secure citizenship in heaven. So then expense number one, it's exactly what Jesus is telling Nicodemus, he would have understood this clearly. Jesus suffered and died on a cross in order to pay the price for the new birth. Jesus suffered and died on a cross is what it means to be lifted up, to be hung on a pole, to be hung on a tree. It is to become a curse. Nicodemus would have understood this from the law. Jesus suffered and died on a cross in order to pay, pay the price for the new birth. Now, how on earth do we receive this gift then there is something that we do there is something where we participate in this work of God well what is it well it's it's very similar to what happened in the wilderness Moses lifted up that bronze serpent on the pole and what did the people have to do they had to look they had to behold now and Jesus is going to be lifted up on the cross he must be looked upon he must be held he must be, be, be seen in the heart. He must be received. He must be believed upon in the heart. Listen to what he says. Read in verse 14 and 15 now. And Moses, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That whoever believes in him, whoever places their confidence, their trust, their allegiance, their life, their eternity in him. What do they receive? They may have eternal life. That's expense number two. Expense number two is not the price to achieve eternal life. It is the price to receive the eternal life. Jesus must be believed on to receive the gift of eternal life. Not everybody goes to heaven. Only people who believe on Jesus with their life. Not everybody goes to a better place. 
Everybody goes, but not necessarily to a better place. It's only people who believe on Jesus with their life. They trust in him. They give everything they have to him. Now, he says this, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Eternal life. Okay, so we need to answer a, a, a problem here. So if I believe in Jesus, I get to live forever. I get eternal life. So does Jesus also mean by not saying it here that if you don't believe in him, you just become annihilated when you die and you go into non-existence? Is that what Jesus is saying here? You believe in him, you live forever. But if you don't believe in him, you just die and go out of existence. Well, that's not at all what the Bible teaches us. In Revelation chapter 20, verse four through six, we come to understand we come to understand that all people live forever. But the people who do not go to the kingdom of God, they go through what is called the second death. And that does not mean, that does not mean that they go out of consciousness. That does not mean that they are obliterated out of existence. It means that they are tormented, not in hell, but in the lake of fire for eternity. Revelation 20, verse four through six. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshiped the beast or its image and had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They came to life, resurrection. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ. They will reign with him for a thousand years. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through five describes the second death a little bit more. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books. And the, the, dead, the dead were judged by what was written in the books. How do you ju judge people that are out of existence? They're not out of existence. They are actually resurrected. There are two resurrections. There is the resurrection that comes to the believers when Jesus returns to earth. But there is also a second resurrection, and this is where death and hell give up their dead. And those dead, they come alive, and they come right before the judgment throne of God. They are not out of existence. They are very much in a conscience, conscious existence. It says, and they are judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation 21, eight says, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Mark chapter nine 47 through 48, Jesus says, and if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. Jesus is saying this, there is eternal life in the kingdom of God and there is eternal death in the lake of fire. Eternal death is a conscious, eternal Torment. He says, where their worm does not die. That means where your person. The, worm, the, the reference there to worm is, the, is the, the life inside of a person, their conscious existence. 
It does not die, nor do the flames of the lake of fire extinguish. Revelation 14, 11 says, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. So don't think that because Jesus says those who believe in him, the one who is hung on a pole, they receive eternal life, that he's saying that if you don't receive eternal life, you just go into darkness, non-existence, and what you did on earth doesn't matter. No, Jesus says everything you did matters. And you'll actually endure judgment for everything that has been done here on the earth. But let's talk about this gift that God gives. He says that whoever believes in him, verse 15, may have eternal life, life into the ages and ages, life into eternity. What is eternal life? It is the blissful, incorruptible, imperishable life that is ultimately enjoyed in the kingdom of God, not here on this earth, but on a new earth that God will create. An earth where there's, there's no struggle, there's no sorrow, there's no death, no sickness, no cancer, no wars. It is Eden perfected with God in the midst, with Jesus in the midst. This is eternal life. This is the existence that God's people will have. Let me tell you this. Maybe you might think that when, if you believe in Jesus, you die and you go to heaven and you sit on a cloud and you pluck a harp. I don't want to sit on clouds. I don't want to pluck a harp. Right? That, that does, that, and I, I don't see that anywhere in the Bible. The, the understanding that the Bible gives us about eternal life is that we are really living in the new earth, seeing Jesus face to face, having dominion over this new earth and the new heavens, enjoying all of the grace that God will pour out on us lavishly because he loves us in Christ. I want that. You know how you receive it? Trust in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Just the same way that the, the Israelites in the wilderness had to look on, G, look on that bronze serpent on the pole. Just, just believe God. Just believe God a little bit. He's saying now you're gonna have to look on Jesus. And you're gonna have to believe on him with your life. I want you to listen to these descriptions about the kingdom of God. And just tell, tell me you don't want to be there. Listen to this. Revelation chapter 21, verse 22 through 22, 5. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. The city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its light is lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by, you know why you don't shut gates by day or by night? You got no enemies. There's no war. The gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will ever enter into it. Nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, brightest crystal, flowing from the throne of God, and the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. That's a glorious, eternal, conscious existence in the kingdom of God. So what must I do? What must I do to receive this eternal life? 
What did Jesus say in verse 15? Whoever believes, whoever puts their trust in Jesus. John 3, 36, Jesus says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Here we see that belief and obedience are one and the same. You believe in Jesus, obey him. Begin to obey God's word. John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. John 6, 40, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. John 6, 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. Is there any mistake, any mistake in our understanding to say, to have eternal life, you've got to believe in Jesus. You can trust in Jesus. Here's the question. John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. This is what the Lord asks. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? See, Jesus suffered death as the price for our eternal life. But to receive it, Got to believe him. Got to trust him. Will Nicodemus trust Jesus? Will Nicodemus believe in Jesus? You know, I believe we do see that answer later in the Gospels. But Nicodemus has died and gone on, I believe, to be with the Lord. You and I are still here. Do you believe this? You trust in Jesus? There's no discrepancy about whether what he says is true or not. He came from heaven and bears witness about it. There's no discrepancy about whether or not it's effective because the price has been paid. The only question is, do you believe it? Do you trust him? Would you pray with me?